I'm going to share this morning uh, briefly from Mark chapter 1. So I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll get into this. Um, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are all about transformation and change. And that, Lord, you uh, accept us just as we are, but you do not leave us as we are. That, Lord, you have a purpose for us, a plan for us, a, a hope for us and a future. And I, I pray, Lord, that even now you would begin to unlock that in the room this morning for some of us that most need it. So, Lord, we are here and available. And we pray, Lord, would you speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh man, I don't know how many of you are fans of the Muppets. Anybody enjoy the Muppets? Uh, Sarah does, yeah, a few, Amy. Um, so Elmo, uh, is, you might have seen, was on, uh, El Perry Elmo was on X, formerly Twitter, uh, who knew? And uh, Elmo this week went on to um, X, formerly Twitter, which is how I've sort of referred to it, isn't it, nowadays? And, um, and, and tweeted this, said, Elmo is just checking in. How is everyone doing? And uh, the response to this was quite remarkable, pretty much broke the internet. Thousands upon thousands of people decided to respond to Elmo. Um, and I don't know whether it's because of like the safety of you know a childhood, uh, uh, you know a figure from from childhood or or whatever. But for whatever reason, everyone felt like they were able to be really, really honest in what they tweeted back or xed back. Is that how you say it now? And uh, this. This is what people said, a few, of the, a few of the things people said. Elmo, Elmo, I'm depressed and broke. Elmo, I'm suffering from existential dread over here. Elmo, we are tired. Elmo, every morning I cannot wait to go back to sleep. Every Monday I cannot wait for Friday to come every single day and every single week for life. Elmo, each day the abyss we stare into grows a unique horror, one that was previously unfathomable in nature. The world is burning, Elmo. And it went on and on and on and on. Do you know, I, I just think the more the time that you spend around people, the more that you realise that pretty much everybody that you meet in life has got some sort of pain underneath the surface that's just right there. And all it takes is for a tweet from Elmo or a kind friend or a supportive community like a Dalom to create that space where all of a sudden you feel safe to talk about what's really going on underneath the surface and it unlocks something. And so again, I just want to say thank you to you guys because I think that what you are creating here is absolutely vital and valuable because people need to be able to talk about these things in the safety of a place where they'll be accepted and loved because we are, we are all carrying this stuff. One of the things that Dunham runs and we run at Hope Church is celebrate recovery. And one of the phrases that I think is really helpful about in the use in celebrate recovery is that, is that it's there for life's hurts, habits and hang-ups. And I think that's a great way to describe it, that all of us are suffering from some sort of way, from hurts in life, things that have happened to us, pain that we have experienced, hang-ups, there might be addictions of one form or, or another, or just habits or... Um, or, or character flaws that we're that we're struggling with, um, habits, uh, hang-ups. What was the third one? <laughs> Hurts. Oh, the other one was habits. Oh, right. Well, we kind of covered both in one, so that's fine. At least we covered all bases. Uh, so you know, there's a sense in which we're all we're all struggling with that stuff, and and I think it's so vital that we create those spaces where people are able to be listened to, not least because that's what Jesus did. Time and time again, as you read, and if you've not ever read through one of the eyewitness accounts of his life, as we know them, the gospel accounts, it's just remarkable as you read through them, the amount of times in which he met somebody, an individual, who no one else had time a day for, and sat down and just listened to them and asked them questions and paid attention to them. And this is one of those stories. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. If you've got a Bible, you might like to open it and just follow along with me. This very short story. A man with leprosy came to him, that's Jesus, and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, can, can you make me clean? Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I'm willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anybody, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. And instead he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news 
As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town but openly stayed outside in lonely places, yet people still came to him from everywhere. This is a remarkable story. This man with leprosy. And um, you might not know much about what that would have meant in the first century Israel when this was written. But, and we don't actually know that much about what leprosy was. It, was. it would have categorized any number of different skin diseases, not one thing in particular, but, but a, a, a whole array of, of different diseases. And if you were someone who had leprosy, you would have been somebody that would have been seen as what was known as being ceremonially unclean, which is not really something, a term, you know, at least not for me, a terminology that I use in day-to-day life, uh, and, but, but would have been familiar at the time. I think probably the closest we get these days is if you if you've got a child who's of primary school age and if they bring home things that they've cooked at school ceremonially unclean right that's the closest that I can think of (laughs) cast it out from the house Uh, straight to the bin when no one's looking yeah it was lovely it was really nice um, ceremonially unclean, and 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 thus this is what would have happened if you were somebody who was categorised as being ceremonially unclean in that culture. You were not allowed to take part in the rest of society. You were banished. You were not allowed to go to the temple to offer sacrifices, which may not seem like a big deal to you, but was a huge deal for these people in those days because it meant there was no way that they could be right with God. So they were banished from society, they were banished from the temple and they were to live a life that was on their own on the outskirts. And of course that meant, and and worth saying actually, that the way in which that they were treated was exactly the same way in which you would treat a dead body. So a dead body was also ceremonially unclean and the way in which a dead body was treated was exactly the same as somebody who was suffering from leprosy was treated. There's a sense in which their condition means that culturally, socially, spiritually, they are dead and that's how they were treated and 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 of course if when you're struggling with something like that it like it it consumes all of you until it becomes your very identity and you imagine that as people saw him it was not oh there's you know uh, poor old Jim over there that's suffering with leprosy it was like oh no look there's the leper and I think that's quite a significant way of phrasing it it's really important to get your head around. Not, oh, look, there's that poor man who's suffering with leprosy, but, oh, look, there is the leper because everything about his pain and his hurts and his habits and his hang-ups came to define everything that he actually was. And you might have experienced that for yourself with things that you have gone through in your own life, difficulties that you've encountered, You think of the difference when someone is struggling with addiction of saying, well, there is someone who is struggling with addiction compared to saying, well, there is someone who is an addict as if it kind of defines the whole of their identity and everything that they are about. Well, there is someone who's struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety, struggling with self-esteem rather than there is someone who is those things. So there is a difference. And I believe one of the things in which, which I, as the church, we stand on the foundation of understanding is that the Bible says that every single person is made in the image of God. Which means that somewhere underneath the surface, no matter what is going on, no matter what they look like, no matter how much pain there is, no matter how much heartache there is, no matter how much pain they've caused to, even to other people, there is something underneath the surface that is incredibly beautiful and valuable and precious and worthy of dignity no matter who they are because fundamentally we understand that that person is not a random assembly of atoms and molecules produced by pure chance but they were created on purpose for a purpose by a God who loves and cares for them and wants them no matter who they are and that means that this man is not a man who is who is a leper but he is someone who's worthy of dignity and respect someone who shouldn't be treated just like a dead body someone who's loved and cherished someone who's created on a purpose for a purpose someone that's made in the image of God he is a divine self-portrait that's who he is and I want you to know this morning that is who you are
You might not have ever felt like that or understood it. There might be pain and heartache in your life. Hey, you might have even, like Leanne, had those struggles of coming into church and just finding it difficult. Maybe even this environment has made you feel like, you know, and I really hope it hasn't and it never should, made you feel like you were less, but because it's not true. You are a divine self-portrait and you are precious and you are loved. And you see that here in Jesus' response to this man. And, and let's just make it clear. In these days, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. He was a rabbi. If you were a man with leprosy who was struggling with that, there is no way, because you were ceremonially unclean, there is no way you should ever go up to somebody like Jesus and start talking to them because you were not worthy of that. But for some reason, this man here takes a chance and he does what he shouldn't have done. Maybe he saw that look in Jesus' eyes across the crowd and he somehow knew that he'd be accepted. So he goes up to him and maybe it's just out of desperation of gotten to the end of himself and he doesn't know what else to do and he, he cries out to Jesus and he just simply says those words, if you are willing, make me clean. And Jesus, it says there, and the word is difficult to translate from the Greek, how Jesus responds. It says the word is somehow a mixture of anger and compassion. And the word in the English is indignant. He somehow feels at the very same time an immense compassion for this man and his struggles and also an immense anger that he should be struggling like this, that he should have ever reached this point of desperation. And, and again, for those of you that are struggling, I'm convinced that is how the Lord feels about you, that he looks at you with a sense of anger, that you should ever have been experiencing this, and with a sense of deep compassion because he genuinely cares about you. And then Jesus does something unthinkable. He reaches out and touches him. And of course, you know, this is a man who's got leprosy, is an incredibly, you know, incredibly contagious and also was ceremonially unclean. If you touch something that was ceremonially unclean, that would make you ceremonially unclean. Obviously, we know, don't we, if you come close to someone who with a, a, an infectious uh, disease, I've currently got a cold, uh, I'm still reco recovering, keep your distance. Uh, you, you know, there's a chance in which you will pick up on, on that thing. And so what, what, what happens, well, we expect that if Jesus touches the man with leprosy, that he would become ceremonially unclean and that he would catch leprosy. But what happens in that moment is that Jesus, Jesus reaches out and touches him and he says those words, be clean. It's like the infection runs the other way. Instead of Jesus getting the leprosy, the man gets Jesus' purity and holiness and righteousness and goodness. And the whole thing runs in the reverse. Because do you know what? There was never a man that was like Jesus. If he was who he claimed to be, if he was God himself, if he was in some sense perfection walking, if he was love on legs walking around, there's a sense in which what happens is that as he dies at the cross and as he lays down his life for us, as he lays down his life for us, he lays it down so that we would pick it up, right? He doesn't just die as a kind of punishment for the wrong things that we did, although it is that, he dies so that we would actually start to pick up his life and carry it and wear it like clothes. And this is what happens to this leper. He, he, the infection starts to run the other way and, and he is transformed. And, and, and I think there's two things that are happening in this moment that maybe we need as well that change everything. And one is, one is the touch of of Jesus and then the other one is the words that Jesus speaks over him because do you know what I think when we are in that place of struggle and pain and we feel like life is falling apart there is a sense if we have that touch from Jesus it it brings everything into perspective some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about that somehow when we connect with God and connect to the divine connect to heaven we almost have a transcendent experience it's like it just shifts the mindset all of a sudden do you know what I mean there's a sense of perspective that starts to happen as you encounter the Lord as you meet us sometimes in, and Keith talked about that when he came into church and he said I experienced and I felt the Holy Spirit and Keith, I'm sure you know Keith there's a sense in which when that happens to you and you have that encounter of touch with God it's like it, it just shifts something of you and the things that you thought were really big deals somehow they just feel like 
they're way smaller than you thought they were. And then Jesus, Jesus speaks words over the leper and he says, be clean. You know, words have an incredibly powerful effect on us, don't they? And it might be like that man would have been called leper or he would have been called a, a name that might have defined him. And you might have been called a, a name that, that has defined you, a, you know, a, a, a failure or a dropout or a loser or an addict or... Or, you know, and it might be things that your parents said or your teachers said. Uh, most likely, the person that's most likely to have said those things to you is, is probably yourself. And there might be words that you have spoken over yourself that you feel like I've come to define you. And you know what? This is just who I am. Well, guess what? Jesus has new words that he wants to speak over you. Be clean. Be holy. Be pure be righteous, be whole, be complete, be perfect. And you might not think, well, any of those words feel like things that actually define me. Hope, love, joy, peace, things that he wants to speak over you. They might not feel like they are things that actually define you in this moment, but there's a sense in which his words are the words that rearrange the cosmos in order to create it in the first place. You, you think that the words that you speak are more powerful than the words he speaks? They're not. No one's words are as powerful as the words that he speaks. He literally made the stars, right? And you, you think that the thing that that person says is more important than what, than what he says about you? It's not. There is, there's nothing that is more powerful than the words of Jesus. And that's, you know, as we come to this moment when we reach out to him, when we say, Lord, are you willing? And he reaches out and touches us. And he reaches out and he speaks over us that it begins to change literally everything because there is power in his touch and there is power in his words and I don't know I just I mean to be quite honest with you this morning I woke up feeling quite ill I've been quite ill this like I shouldn't really be here at all to be perfectly honest with you but I I just I had to come because I just uh, this has been so laid on my heart this week and I was looking forward to this Sunday and I I just couldn't help but want to be here selfishly <laughs> because like, I just feel this is so important for so many of you to understand and to get a hold of that there is a God that loves you and cares for you, that wants to meet you and encounter you, that wants to touch you, that wants to speak words of life over you and wants to bring transformation into your life and he's willing today to receive you. We've heard a few stories this morning, but before I finish, I just wanted to share with you one more story. Um, and we, it's actually an audio clip we're going to play, and it's the story of, um, I'll make sure I say her name right, Ayan uh, Hershey Ali. Some of you might have seen her story because it's been floating around social media a lot. You might not, don't worry if you haven't. She uh, grew up in Somalia um, uh, underneath the radical Islamic movement, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, she then fl fled that to, to Holland. She became an a, a political activist um, and then became a very outspoken um, public figure, um, particularly talking about atheism. So she often, shared, if you're familiar with Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens or Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris, those figures, she often shared a stage with them. She wrote a, a book about atheism um, and that was really her, her life um, until recently. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit of her story. So let's just listen to this. Very personal level. I went through a period of crisis, um, very personal crisis of fear, anxiety, depression. I went to the best therapists, money can pay. I think they gave me an explanation of some of the things that I was struggling with but I continued to have this um, big spiritual hole or need, as you call it. Um, I tried to self-medicate. I tried to sedate myself. Um, I drank enough alcohol you could use to sterilize a hospital. And then Hannah, it would not, uh, nothing helped. Um, I continued to read, you know, books on psychiatry in the brain, and none of that helped. All of that explained a small piece of the puzzle, but there was still something that I was missing. 
Um, and then I think it was one um, therapist who said to me early this year, I think I am, you're spiritually bankrupt. And at that point, I was in a place um, where I had sort of given up hope. I was in this place of darkness and I thought, well, what the hell? Uh, I'm going to open myself to that and see, see, you know, ask her, what are you talking about? Mm. And we started talking about faith and a belief in God. And I explained to her that the God I grew up with was a horror show. Um, he created you to punish you and frightened you. And, you know, as a girl and as a woman, you're just a piece of trash. And so I said to her, I explained to her why I didn't believe in God and more than that, why I actually hated God. And then she asked me to design my own God. And she said, if you had the power to, you know, attribute a higher power, if, if you had the power to, to make your own God, what would you do? And <laughs> as I was going on, I thought, yeah, right. Uh, that's actually a description of Jesus Christ and Christianity at its best. And so instead of inventing yet another new God, <laughs> um, I started diving into, um, in, into that story. Um, and so far, um, you know, my husband and I go, it went about both of us saying we're atheists. And now it's, I like this story. I exploit it. And um, the more I look at it, the more I don't want to say I'm fulfilled, but I feel I no longer have this need, this this void. I have to say, and I mm. feel like I'm I'm going somewhere. Should we stand? I'm just going to respond now by worshiping and singing to the Lord. And I just want to say really that as you think about what I've said, there's, a, I guess, three responses in relation to the pain that we all experience in life. Response A, give up. Not a good response. I don't recommend that one. Response B, grit your teeth and try harder. And I think that does get you so far. It does help in some senses. There's a great deal in which you can do by yourself. Response three, C, is to as that man with leprosy did, come to the Lord Jesus, lay down at his feet and cry to him, Lord, if you are willing. And I tell you, he is always willing and always able and always ready to receive you.